Kia ora koutou. Welcome to all alumni and friends of the University of Auckland to this, the second in our exciting series of talks, Raising the Bar, Auckland Home Edition. My name's Mark Bentley. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Development, and it's my pleasure to have you on board, or indeed even back on board, if you listened last week to our first event from Professor Tracy McIntosh. For the newbies among you, let me quickly explain that for the last three years, we've enjoyed raising the bar on one spectacular night in Auckland by bringing 20 of the most thought-provoking academics from the university into the city's bars to give interesting talks. Rather than risk that in the current coronavirus environment, we've brought everything online this year. So Aucklanders can still get their dose of intellectual inspiration, but we can also share it with our worldwide audience. In total, we've got great, six great speakers over six weeks, and we've had lots of interest in tonight's speaker microbiologist Susie Wiles. Like many of her University of Auckland colleagues, Susie has been at the absolute forefront of making sure that science, not pseudoscience, is driving decisions that protect us from COVID-19. So without further ado, let me hand over to your MC for the evening, Dr. Dr. Bridget Cool, who will introduce Susie and also uh, help you to pose your questions a little bit later. So a little bit of background on Bridget. Bridget is the Associate Dean at the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences. She is an injury epidemiologist whose research interests include the role of alcohol in injuries. So be careful out there while you're drinking and watching. In a former life, uh, Bridget was a ski instructor. So cool by nature, uh, cool by name and doubly cool by nature. Over to you, Bridget. Thank you, Mark. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Susie Wiles. Susie is a microbiologist and bioluminescence enthusiast, but to many, she's that pink-haired science lady. Susie was born in the UK where she studied microbiology and worked as a researcher before relocating to New Zealand in 2009. Here at the University of Auckland, Susie heads up the bioluminescence superbugs lab, where she combines her twin passions to understand infectious diseases and to find new antibiotics. Susie's won numerous awards and in 2019 was appointed a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to microbiology and science communication. In fact, many of you will have seen Susie grace our television screens and heard her on the radio talking about science. And of course, in recent months, she's been providing commentary on COVID. The title of Susie's talk this, this evening is From Glowing Grubs to Superbugs, The Quest for New Medicines. But before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention, and Mark touched on this earlier, that at the bottom of your screen, there's a question and answer function. So if you think of any questions along the way, just pop them in that question and answer box, and we'll leave some time at the end so we can go through any of those questions. But for now, let's hear from Susie. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So let me share my screen. Uh, so kia ora folks, um, and uh, thanks for coming along um, to my talk from Going Grub to Superbugs. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess we'll start with the superbugs. Uh, and then I'll um, explain a little bit about what the glowing grubs bit means um, and move on from there. Um, so, as Bridget said, I'm a microbiologist. I am fascinated by infectious diseases, um, and I really got into infectious diseases as a teenager um, when I was given this book, the Fireside Book of Deadly Diseases. Uh, and it was, I just found it fascinating. It's full of stories about tuberculosis, um, cholera, the plague. Uh, and at that time, I was really fascinated by how something as small as a bacterium or a virus, you know, could get into our bodies and, and uh, make us really unwell, but also how these infections um, change the course of human history. And of course, we're now living through um, something like this. So it's really, I guess, we're all now seeing the power of, uh, of infectious diseases um, and, and just how they can upend everything about our lives. Um, so I kind of feel like I'm giving this talk in a slightly different context to how I normally give it. Um, normally I feel like I have to justify why infectious diseases are important because um, while they are a major killer still in many, many countries, um, you know, in, in, in lots of countries um, like New Zealand, um, they're a bit neglected, really, I guess. There's uh, you know, more of an interest or more of a focus on what we call non-communicable diseases. Um, 
But yeah, well, there you go. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So we now uh, fully understand a bit more about how important infectious diseases are. But I'm going to focus today on bacterial infections rather than viral infections. Um, and so I hope at the end of my talk, you'll understand a little bit more about um, why I do the research that I do um, and why I think bacteria are important too. Uh, so I'm going to start with this number, one in four. Um, and this is the number of people who are hospitalized every year um, through, or through infectious diseases um, in New Zealand. Uh, and it's a number that's been rising over, um, over the last few decades. So we're, a really amazing study uh, was published in the last a few years ago. Um, and this, this is a very prestigious medical journal. And what they did was they took all the data around why people are hospitalized in New Zealand and how that had changed over time. And what they showed was that um, over a 20 year period, the hospitalizations from uh, these non-communicable diseases went up by about 7%. Um, but what they also showed was that uh, hospitalizations from um, infectious diseases went up by um, uh, 50%. So they've been rising um, a huge amount. The good thing, I guess, um, is that uh, we have these incredible medicines to treat bacterial infections. They're called antibiotics, um, which probably most people in their lives have taken one. Uh, and what I just want to show you with this, um, this slide is the fact that there are lots of different kinds of antibiotics, different classes. Um, here they all are showing little, um, a little chemical structure of kind of one of the, of the drugs in the class. Um, but what you can also see in the, in the middle is a little um, timeline of when these different classes of antibiotics were discovered. Uh, and so it started with the discovery of penicillin in the 1920s. Um, this came um, from uh, Alexander Fleming, uh, happened in London, and it was uh, the discovery of an antibiotic made by a fungus, penicillium. Uh, and then this sort of started that, uh, this kind of gold rush of looking for these incredible medicines. It had its heyday in kind of the 50s and 60s. Um, but then since then, has, uh, there's been a sort of a drop off in, um, in uh, research in this space. But anyway, so what we've, uh, what we've ended up with today um, is a class of these different antibiotics um, that work in different ways. And these are, these are medicines that kill bacteria. Uh, so how do they work? Well, so this is a, a, a rather um, cartoon form of a bacterium. Uh, and basically different classes of antibiotics have different what we call targets. So there are some antibiotics that act on the cell wall of a bacteria, others that act on the cell membrane. There are ones that interfere with the um, synthesis of proteins or with DNA and RNA others that interact with um, important processes um, in the cell. Uh, and so basically, depending on what drug it is and what it targets, we can get drugs that are either what we call broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. So a broad spectrum antibiotic is one that uh, has a target in lots of different species of bacteria. Um, and so uh, it can kill a broad number of bacteria. Whereas narrow spectrum ones are, um, have a target that's in, a, in a, um, a, a smaller number of different bacterial species. Um, so that's kind of the kind of broad categories. Uh, and then also depending on what that target is, um, antibiotics can either be bactericidal, which means they kill bacteria, or they can be bacteriostatic, which means they stop bacteria from growing. So the idea with those drugs is that then you just stop them from growing and your body can do the job of, of cleaning them up. Okay, so we have these uh, incredible drugs. Um, what I want to show you is the, is the thing that I'm really interested in is the fact that we are basically, um, the bacteria are essentially evolving to become resistant to these drugs. So they're not working anymore. Um, and what I'm gonna show you is a clip from a, this amazing video, which is an experiment by a scientist called Michael Baum at Harvard. Um, what we found this morning is that if I, if I play this video and talk you through it, you won't be able to hear me, but it'll go all weird with sound. So I'm going to talk you through a couple of frames and then I'm going to let you watch the video. But essentially, his, uh, what he's developed is what he calls the mega plate. So this is a ginormous Petri dish. It is a meter long by half a meter wide, um, and it's divided into sections. And so in each of these sections is this jelly that bacteria like to grow on called agar. Um, and what he, what Michael also adds is an antibiotic that will kill the particular um, bacterium that he is studying. So what he does on the ends, he puts uh, this agar jelly with no antibiotic. And then in the next segment, he puts just an amount that would normally kill that bacteria that he's studying, then 10 times that amount, 100 times that amount, and then 1,000 times that amount. And then what he does is he puts another layer of jelly over the top of this 
uh, which is a little bit more sloppy. And so if a bacteria has a tail, it can swim through this jelly. Okay, then what he does is he sets up a time-lapse camera on the top and he adds the bacteria to the ends where there's no antibiotic and then he films them growing. So what you're gonna see in the next, of the next minute um, is the bacteria in white starting from those edges and growing through these um, different amounts of an antibiotic that would normally kill it. Okay, so watch this. Okay, so what you've just watched is basically evolution in action. So what you were watching was the bacterium growing over the area where there's no antibiotic, and then it stopped when it got to the edges. And what it required was a mutation that allowed the bacterium then to grow in the presence of that antibiotic. And what we could see is these mutations um, coming that allowed the bacteria to grow in, in higher and higher concentrations of this antibiotic until it finally got to the middle, which was a thousand times the amount of antibiotic that would have normally killed it. Um, and we can see those um, mutants there. The other really interesting thing about this is you can see the, mut the mutants kind of competing with each other. Um, some of them are really fast, some of them are really slow. Uh, and um, what uh, Michael does then is um, basically take bacteria from uh, all the different places to find out what mutations have happened. So this experiment was done with E. coli, which is a common organism in our guts, but it also there are versions of it that cause food poisoning, that cause blood poisoning, that cause um, uh, urinary tract infections. And what you watched was E. coli becoming resistant to an antibiotic in 11 days. So in 11 days, this organism can become resistant uh, and then essentially be difficult to treat if you end up with an infection. Um, and so this is what, uh, what is happening. What you also saw was a completely natural process. So these bacteria, um, every time a bacteria uh, basically replicates itself, it can make um, mistakes in its, in, in its um, DNA. Uh, and just by sheer chance, these mistakes can sometimes make the bacteria resistant to antibiotics. So it's a completely natural process uh, and can render the drugs that we have completely useless. Okay, so if we go back to targets, there are lots of different ways that bacteria can become resistant um, and they will depend on what the antibiotic is. So they can make uh, um, enzymes that basically chomp up different types of antibiotics. They can produce pumps that just pump the antibiotic straight back out the cell again. They can modify the targets um, that the antibiotic binds to, um, or they can come up with ways to bypass. So for example, if an antibiotic uh, impacts on a, a really important process in the cell, they can come up with ways that basically don't use that process anymore. So there are lots of different things and they will depend on the antibiotic and they will also depend on the bacteria. All right. So that's what we saw was this natural process of uh, this mutation um, where they become resistant to um, antibiotics. But the other thing that bacteria can also do is they can share that resistance with other species. And there are three main ways that this happens and we call this horizontal gene transfer. So the first way is transformation. And this is basically the ability of bacteria to pick up DNA from their environment. So um, you can imagine a bacterium that's basically uh, become resistant by mutation and perhaps it died uh, and its um, genetic material has been released into the soil or the water. There are other bacteria that can take that genetic material up and then they can start expressing that gene and become resistant themselves. Um, some bacteria are really good at this. They'll just suck up any DNA. Um, others, you have to zap them with electricity. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, the second method is called transduction, and this is basically when bacteria become infected with a virus. Um, and so viruses essentially, the same as they do in our cells, 
bacteria can become um, uh, infected with viruses too, uh, and they turn those cells into little virus producing factories. And sometimes when the viruses are repackaging themselves um, in a, you know, to leave the, the bacterial cell, they can take a little bit of the genetic material of the bacteria with them. And so if that's an antibiotic resistance gene, then they can basically move that to the next bacterium that they go on to infect. And then the last method, which is probably the most important method, is called conjugation. And this is like the bacterial equivalent of sex, where um, two, bacterial, uh, two bacteria come together, they build a little bridge, and then we see um, genetic material moving from one um, bacterium to the other. The thing that's really important about this process, though, is it can happen between completely unrelated species of bacteria. So it's kind of like the equivalent of... Um, I know, a whale having sex with a giraffe or something. So it happens between completely different uh, species and is a way for resistance to go from, uh, say, for example, a bacterium that lives in soil and causes no problems with humans to one that lives up your nose and can cause septicemia. So this is a really, really important um, process. Okay, so bacteria can become resistance, uh, resistant by sheer chance and then can transfer this, um, this resistance around. What's really important though, I guess, is that um, this process is happening all around us, but it's really only when um, antibiotics are present in the environment that those resistant organisms have an actual advantage. And so this slide just represents all the ways and places where we use antibiotics. And I use we as the kind of humans rather than very specific saying New Zealanders, but basically as humans, we have used antibiotics pretty um, uh, what's the best word for it? I mean, we've not been very good about how we use antibiotics. <laughs> we've uh, we use them in all sorts of environments. So we use them in people, obviously, uh, to um, prevent infections uh, in vulnerable people, but also to treat infections. Um, and we also use them to do the same thing, so to prevent infections or treat infections in um, in our animals, our plants, and also our seafood. So in aquaculture, in agriculture horticulture, all of these things um, are places where antibiotics are used. Um, they also end up in the environment in the factories that produce them. So they can end up in the water um, and in the soil. And then the same as, you know, wherever we take antibiotics and whether animals take antibiotics, uh, they can just pass, most of them pass through our body and into our waste and then into our environment. So all around the world, to varying degrees, um, are basically antibiotics in our environment. And that means that organisms in our guts, in the soil, in the water, are exposed to these antibiotics. And then if they are resist, become resistant, they have an advantage in those environments. And it's such a global issue that it doesn't matter where this happens, um, you just, you just need someone to get on a plane and they, you know, with an antibiotic resistance superbug either in their nose or, or in their gut and it can end up anywhere in the, in the world. And this is what we've seen. So we've seen organisms that have um, started in a particular place, a particular country because of perhaps a practice that that, can, that country has had. And then through people moving, they have ended up establishing pretty much all over the world. Okay. So um, what this chart shows is basically uh, a timeline again um, with um, the discovery of different antibiotics um, and then when resistance to those antibiotics were, uh, was found. So every color of dot is basically a different class of antibiotics. And what you can essentially see is that um, at some point after the um, antibiotics started being used in people in the clinics, um, uh, antibiotic, um, antibiotic resistant organisms were found to those drugs. And sometimes it took a few years and other times it was really, really, really quick. Um, what this means is that uh, going back to the 1940s when penicillins were first used, you know, organisms became resistant. Um, but then what happened was the doctors would just go to the cupboard essentially and pick out a new antibiotic. So you can imagine this time we had in the 50s and 60s where the cupboard was being filled with all these new compounds. Um, and as organisms became resistant, the doctors just went and found a new, a new drug to use. The problem is the big yellow, uh, sorry, orange um, circle uh, in the corner, which essentially represents the last 30 years of uh, not filling the cupboard up anymore. Um, so what we've said, we call this the discovery void. And essentially what we've been living through um, is a, a time where um, interest and in research in infectious diseases has waned. Uh, there's been, you know, numbers of de uh, infectious diseases um, have kind of fallen in lots of countries. Um, and so the focus has been on um, doing research and finding medicines for non-communicable diseases. And so this has left us with essentially an empty cupboard 
Uh, and um, now some uh, organisms that are almost completely or, or completely resistant to antibiotics and are more or less completely untreatable. So then 2014, the WHO did a big uh, report on this. The microbiologists have been yelling about this for years, but the, it was, the big report was done in 2014. Um, and this is a quote from Margaret Chan, who's the former director general of the World Health Organization. And so she called it the end of modern medicine as we know it. And what she means is that when we um, lose antibiotics uh, as well as antifungal agents and antiviral agents, um, when we don't have those anymore, not only do we lose our ability to treat people with infectious diseases, but we lose our ability to do things like routine surgery um, or surgeries like um, tr organ transplants. Um, we lose our ability to do chemotherapy for cancer. All of those things require vulnerable patients being put on antibiotics to protect them from infection while they undergo the treatment that they're going through. And so when we can no longer basically um, you know, protect those patients, they will end up um, dying in large numbers from infectious diseases rather than the disease that they're actually um, that they're trying to be treated for. Um, and so this, this is happening. There, um, there are now basically uh, infectious agents that are um, pretty much untreatable. And this is a headline from a few years ago. Um, woman dies of superbug, no antibiotic could treat. Um, and so with this particular organism, I mean, these are the thing that's worrying about these organisms is they can also be carried by people with no problems. So you can carry these organisms up your nose or in your gut. Even if you've never taken antibiotics before, you could have one of these organisms um, in you. Uh, and it will pose you no harm until perhaps you end up in hospital and it gets into your bloodstream or, uh, or you pass it to someone else and it, and it ends up in their bloodstream. And so in this case, um, this person, uh, got an infection with this organism, they tried 26 different antibiotics, none of them worked and the person died. And so what we're going to see in the future um, is more and more cases uh, like this. So the way where we are at at the moment is there are lots of organisms for which it is more difficult to treat um, those, pa those patients than it used to be. So for example, there are some sexually transmitted infections where it used to be just a course of oral antibiotics. Now it requires an injection and some oral antibiotics. There are others where you now have to go into hospital and be on an IV drip to deliver the antibiotics. Um, and for some of those antibiotics, you know, uh, they're less safe or they have more side effects um, so, uh, and they're more expensive to deliver. So it's not just about not being able to treat something completely. It's also that the treatments are becoming more, more difficult if they can still be treated. So the, that led the WHO to come up with their priority pathogen list. So these are the list of organisms that they want people to be focusing on if they're doing um, antibiotic discovery. Uh, and it's basically divided into three categories medium, high, and critical. And the critical ones are the ones like that woman who died in America. And um, these are ones for which there are basically um, almost no treatments um, left. If you're interested in uh, learning a little bit more about this, I wrote a little book. Um, it's quite little uh, and apparently quite readable. Um, so my mum says, but I guess mums would say that. Um, so this is uh, published by Bridget William Books. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's um, it kind of explains the different organisms and how they become resistant and a little bit about antibiotic discovery and why we're in the pickle that we're in. All right, so that's kind of why I'm really interested in infectious diseases, why I'm particularly interested in bacterial infections. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about what my lab is actually trying to do to help this problem. Um, and so that brings me, I guess, to the name of my lab, the Bioluminescent Superbugs Lab. So this is us in cartoon form. I've got this great team of students and technicians um, who are all um, as interested in infectious diseases as I am. Uh, and I guess um, the, the, where we get our name from brings me to the second part of my title, which is uh, basically the glowing grubs. So uh, if you're a New Zealander, you should recognize this picture. Um, this is our iconic glowworm. Here is the glowing grub. So this is the larvae of um, a little, uh, little insect, flying insect called the fungus gnat. Um, so it's a bit like a mosquito, but doesn't have the bitey bit, I guess. Um, they, kind of, they look quite mosquito-like, quite tiny. Um, but they spend actually most of their life, so nine to 12 months, as this larvae form. Um, and what they do is they um, um, basically make themselves a silk hammock that they um, uh, hang from cave walls. 
uh, in this little hammock. Um, and then they make these incredible little fishing um, lines that you can see. So these are made of silk and then they've got um, sticky droplets on them. And the idea is that these uh, organisms, these uh, glowworms, they, they glow. Um, and that glow uh, is pretending to be the exit of a cave. So the idea is that flying insects will fly towards the light, thinking that they're leaving the cave. Um, and actually all they're doing is flying into these sticky fishing lines and then forming the food um, of these little carnivorous insects. So um, this production of light by living organisms is called bioluminescence. Um, and there are lots and lots of creatures that, um, that glow. Not just the glowworms, there are fireflies, which are beetles that glow, um, and also lots and lots of bacteria, especially in the ocean. And all of these creatures are making light using um, a chemical reaction that has this light made as a byproduct. Um, and all the creatures um, use slightly different chemical reactions. Um, what I want to show you now, we still, we still don't fully know the entire reaction that um, uh, glowworms use. But one that's been really well studied for many, many years uh, is the one that um, bacteria in the ocean use. So you've probably seen Finding Nemo, the movie. Well, that, um, the anglerfish from that, that has the glowing fishing line, that uh, glow on the end of that fishing line comes from a bacteria that glows. So this shows you the chemical reaction of, that, um, of the bacteria that glow. Uh, so they basically have five genes called the Lux operon. Um, Lux A and B make this enzyme called the luciferase, and that enzyme converts an aldehyde into a fatty acid, um, producing light as a byproduct. They also have these other three genes called C, D, and E, and what they do is they convert the fatty acid back into an aldehyde. Um, so if we take all of these genes and we put them inside a bacterium, then provided they have oxygen and that they're alive, they will produce light. So basically that's the job of the bioluminescent superbugs lab. So we take these five genes and we put them into any nasty bacteria that will sit still long enough using electricity. So we basically zap them with electricity, pop these genes in, and then providing they're alive, they will glow. And this is what they look like. So this is a flask of bacteria. Uh, the yellowy side is that flask of bacteria just visualized in the light. So once we've got lights on, they're just this kind of yellowy color. But when we turn the lights off, they make this amazing blue um, light. And it's blue because that's the color of light that actually travels best through water. Um, and so, uh, yeah, why the hell would we do this, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> is, is, is one question I often get asked. Um, and so there are two main reasons for this. So. The first reason is it's kind of like the lazy microbiologist way to do microbiology. So we can use light to basically count our bacteria. So the idea is that the more bacteria there are, the brighter the light will be. Um, and rather than taking bacteria and plating them onto these um, Petri dishes and counting the number of colonies that, that grow, we can just take a sample and put it in a machine that measures light. And then we'll get an idea of how many bacteria there are from the reading that we get. So the first graph is just to show you that basically as the numbers of bacteria grow, so does the levels of light. And you have to remember this is a really fast way as well of doing this. So instead of having to wait for the colonies to grow on a Petri dish, uh, which for some bacteria only takes um, like a, you know, only takes a, um, a, a few days, um, others can take weeks and weeks. So this, this is a very, really quick way of doing it. But the other thing is I mentioned that they have to be alive. So we actually have a, a really fast way of finding out whether bacteria are dead or alive. And that's what the second um, picture shows. So that wherever you can see the colors of light, that's basically live bacteria. And wherever you can see just the kind of shiny black stuff, that's dead bacteria. So this is why um, we do it. So uh, in my lab, we have several projects going on, but the one I want to talk to you about for a couple of minutes um, is uh, basically our antibiotic discovery project. And this um, came about through collaboration with Manaki Fenua, who are one of our um, Crown Research Institutes here in New Zealand. And essentially, they have a collection of thousands of fungi um, that are kept in uh, liquid nitrogen um, and have never been systematically searched for antibiotics um, against the bacterial strains that are causing these problems in humans. And so what we do in my lab is we basically have collaboration with Bevan Weir, who's the curator of this um, collection of fungi. Uh, they grow the fungi for us, they pass them over to my lab, we pit them against our glowing bacteria, and if any of the fungi turn the lights out, then we basically grow that fungi up in large amounts, freeze dry it, and then we send it to our colleagues over in chemistry, Brent Kopp, 
Um, and then it's their job to try and find out what is in that freeze dried mush um, uh, it, you know, that does the killing. And the idea is that hopefully we won't just find penicillin over and over and over again. Funnily enough, we haven't found penicillin at all, which is, I was very surprised by. We found a few other things that are known, but not that. Um, so this is one of the ways that we screen our fungi. This is um, basically growing them on petri dishes. So we grow them, we um, stamp out little um, round circles uh, that we then fill with our bacteria. And then this is a picture of our bacteria. So this can be, this is four different species of bacteria and we basically look for light. And then this way we can see, is the uh, fungi producing anything that kills them? Is it producing something broad spectrum? Does it kill all the bacteria that we try? Or is it narrow spectrum? It's only killing one or so species. Um, and so this is what we've been doing. Oh, another thing we've tried is, um, what we've realized now is that actually you, you, uh, each fungus has its own particular conditions that it likes to uh, make antibiotics in. So this, um, a picture just shows you it's basically a list of different fungi um, grown in different uh, media so uh, and then grown to different sizes so different ages and essentially where you can see a, a green box that's a fungi that's active and what you can see is that there aren't all green boxes right and there, in fact there isn't just one particular line of green boxes so every fungi has its own particular conditions that it um, prefers and we're having to try and figure out which is the right one for each fungus to then discover what compounds are being made. So we screened hundreds of isolates. There are about 10,000 in the collection, so we've still got one way to go. And um, we've identified about 50 compounds, and we've got about six of those that are novel, which is really exciting. Um, and now we're trying to find with more compounds and also figure out whether any of these are actually anti new antibiotics or potential new antibiotics. Um, this is a project that's been going on since 2015. Um, these are all amazing students and technicians that I've had that have worked on it. Um, the current team is made up of Dr. Melissa Cadellis, who's basically in the chemistry side, so she does all the chemistry and uh, helped by Shara. And then uh, Yiwei, Alex and Daniel are in my lab doing all the microbiology. Um, and this is funded through uh, Cure Kids. It's funded through crowdfunding, through donations to my lab, and also a very, very uh, generous donation from New Zealand Carbon Farming. So um, we thank them all for allowing us to do this um, work. One of the things that I'm really interested in uh, actually is, is um, being more open about what we do. So there's a big project that we're essentially going forward at the moment with trying to open up all of our data. This little picture shows you that basically when a scientist um, does their experiments and they report their experiments to other scientists, what they generally um, what they generally give you is the icing on the cake, right? You get all the really good, really interesting uh, stuff and all the really mundane, dead ends kind of get left behind. And what I'm really interested in doing in my lab is showing you all those dead ends so that if anybody else is potentially pursuing a dead end, they stop. Or if they see what we're doing, they might go, oh no, that's a dead end with me. You should stop. So um, yeah, watch this space. We're going to be putting up all of our data um, online kind of possibly in real time as well if we can get our, get our act together. Um, if you'd like to support this work, the university has uh, very generously put a little link up for me um, so you can basically sponsor a fungus and we'll um, uh, allocate you one of the 10,000 and then let you know how we get on trying to find antibiotics from it. Um, and if you'd like something a little bit different, maybe you've got a birthday coming up that, uh, or somebody with a birthday that you don't know what to get them, um, then we have um, basically used non-dangerous uh, glowing bacteria to um, work with artists to make art. And this is all available on a, on a site called Redbubble. So you can get t-shirts and all sorts of things made out of essentially pictures taken of glowing bacteria. Um, and all of the proceeds from that again go towards our um, lab's research. Uh, and with that, I will thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Brilliant, thank you, Susie. Really interesting presentation, very lively. And I can see why you're fascinated by uh, what you do and you're very good at communicating to it and can clearly see why you've been awarded the awards you have done. A couple of things I'd like to touch base on before we go to a very lively uh, questions that are popping up. <laughs> One of them is thinking about that void in antibiotics not being developed for 30 years. And you might think that with the um, epidemiological transition that we still have the predominance of those infectious diseases killing people in low and middle income countries. So is it the fact that um, the money for big pharma is, is, is more directed at non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular disease, and that's why there's been this void because the money's not being targeted to, 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 to diseases that are, are killing people in low and middle income countries? 
yes, that's one one I guess one way uh, to put it. So um, one of the issues is that back in the nineties there was a real switch in the way that drug discovery was done. So up until that point, it was very much done the way that we do it, where you basically take compounds or things and you pit them against the bacteria, the whole bacteria, and then say, does it kill it or not? In the 90s, there was a real shift to what we call um, target-based design. So saying, we know what the genetic makeup of of a bacterium is, what are the chinks in its armor, and then design particular drugs to attack those chinks. And so there were many of the pharmaceutical companies spent billions and billions of dollars um, completely rejigging all of their um, antibiotic discovery projects to do this particular approach. And not a single drug made it to market using that approach. So loads and loads of compounds were found that really did target those things, that really did work against what they were designed to work against. But when you put them against the whole bacterium, they didn't work. So um, it was a a really fantastic way of discovering antiviral agents. So it's worked really well for some things, but for bacteria, it was really unsuccessful. And so most of those companies, having spent billions of dollars, just said, we're out of here, right? You know, we might as well go and make something else. And I think combined with the issue of resistance, where, you know, you could spend billions getting a drug to market, and then two years later, it's completely useless. You know, this is not a drug, you know, even if you make an antibiotic, the doctors will be going, well, we're only going to prescribe it when absolutely necessary, you know, the economics don't make sense. So it's both been a uh, getting their fingers burned by the way that, you know, about, about how drugs are discovered with um, not being able to sell many of them because of the way that they need to be used because they are so precious. Um, with actually, it's just cheaper and, and more economical to just, you know, to just develop another variant of a drug that lots and lots of people will need to take. So it's a real indication, I think, that, um, that, you know, that this kind of thing should not be a for-profit business, right? Our health should not be a for-profit business. And it's really interesting that um, recently, uh, or in the last few years, um, the UK did another uh, analysis of antibiotic resistance. Um, They got an economic, uh, an economist to do it, uh, Sir Jim O'Neill. And he, you know, knowing nothing about antibiotic resistance, he was asked to kind of look at this issue and not just antibiotics, but antivirals and antifungals and say, you know, what is the, uh, what's the economic impact of this going to be? And he came back going, it's going to be massive. You know, these resistant organisms are going to kill more people than cancer. It's going to be huge. Uh, and so he came up with a whole bunch of ways that to try and incentivize the drug companies to come back into the space. And there were things around, you know, tax incentives and giving them ways to get, um, maybe they could have like a, a fast track for their other drugs if they spent money in the space. Um, but it's been really interesting that very little has happened since his review, which was a few years ago. And so um, last year, late last year, he came out and said he thought that, again, so as, and from an economics point of view, he was like, actually, this just does not work. This is such a big issue in our future that we should be nationalizing pharmaceutical companies. And so, and take, so it's not a for-profit thing anymore. It's obviously not something that's happened, <laughs> but it just shows what a, what a big problem we face, you know, that, that all the discovery work or the vast majority of discovery work is being done by academic labs and, you know, small companies, um, but they don't have the might to move them any, you know, move those drugs any further, but it's not economic, uh, uh, economical for the big companies to do it. So we're in a bit of a pickle. I'm, I'm yeah, and now we're in the middle of a pandemic. So, we, you know, this is... <laughs> just shows that we need to be doing things differently moving forward, I think. So just um, before we move to the questions, just talking about funding, you know, the fact you've got the very innovative idea of sponsoring a fungus and those cool um, images and things to sell that merchandise, it would suggest that the funding for your own research um, can be a challenge. So can perhaps talk to us for a moment how you go about funding your research? How do you attract funding for that? Yeah, so it's kind of ironic that um, for many years I've been a bit of a poster child for science in New Zealand, but I can't actually get any funding. <laughs> so, as you know, this project has been going since 2015 and it's been going on the smell of an oily rag. So we've had very small grants from a um, fantastic uh, little charity called Cure Kids. So I um, highly recommend you support them. But, you know, we've been trying every way that we would normally go. So here in New Zealand, we have, um, you know, the government has a certain allocation for research. Um, there, there is a big pot of that that goes to more projects that are much closer to being products, um, especially kind of that might have an impact on the economy. Um, There's the national science challenges. So these were um, projects that started maybe five or six years ago that were all about um, 
a, you know, a completely different way of funding science. So the idea was uh, getting the public to help decide what were the um, 10 big challenges that we faced um, and that science could help with. And really interestingly, um, so I was part of that uh, public campaign. Um, I got the most votes. <laughs> Infectious diseases were seen to be really, really important but they didn't make the list that the um, professional, you know, that the academics put together. And so they didn't make a challenge. And there are three health related challenges and infectious diseases are specifically excluded from them. So that pot of money is completely um, also not not available to us. There are no real charities that are completely focused on infectious diseases. So whereas, you know, there are the cancer charity and neurological foundation. So we don't have anything of that to go to. So really the only places that are left are um, the two big funders in New Zealand, um, which is the Marsden Fund. So that's for kind of blue skies research uh, and then the Health Research Council. Um, and the problem with those is that, uh, so you have to obviously have an idea which you present um, and then it's kind of based on uh, who, you know, who's on the panels, what um, ideas they deem the most you know, important and then what everybody's CV is like. And so unfortunately, uh, uh, and they only fund about 10% of the applications. So if for every 100 applications that go in, no matter how good they are, they can only fund 10. And so for whatever reasons, whether this is not interesting or exciting enough, or my CV is just not good enough compared to, you know, some of the big professors. Um, yeah, we've been spectacularly unsuccessful. And yet for me, this is such a big problem. It's not something that, you know, it's just something I couldn't walk away from and say, well, we're just not going to do this research. And so that's why I focused on trying to get the public to help, um, you know, to say, you know, help us do this. Um, it costs $250 to screen every one of those fungi. Um, you know, we need help. And, and what's been a fantastic has been the public coming on board and saying, yeah, okay, we'll help. <laughs> Brilliant. So, yeah. I like the innovation, but we do need to, to persuade people, the, the powers that be, the funding agencies, that this is a really important area. So if we just go to the questions now, um, an anonymous attendee has asked, given the risk of antibiotic resistance, in your estimation, should there be more scrutiny, if not regulation, over their use in prescribing? Oh yeah, I mean there are there are lots of different um, aspects to resistance, and so we do know that they are prescribed very heavily. But actually, in New Zealand, I mean, for some of those, it's really necessary. So we do know that um, that there are some uh, people who demand antibiotics when they don't need them. So we, you know, there's a there's a, a real need for people to understand that when your doctor says no. <laughs> They really mean no, it's really for everybody's good that they're not going to give you a prescription. Um, but also, you know, there are some doctors, not many now, but who might need educating about what's the best antibiotic to prescribe or when it's needed. Um, so we definitely, and we, we do know there's been plenty of studies done that have shown that, you know, in winter we see this resurgence of, of or, or a higher use of antibiotics kind of um, and most of those will be for viral infections and antibiotics don't work for viral infections. So there's definitely um, need for work in this area, but it is also an area. Um, so one of the unfortunate things about COVID, I guess, is that we did have an antibiotic um, resistance action plan or an antimicrobial resistance action plan. Um, and actually the COVID has just blown that out of the water. So there's basically very little work now being done in the space while we deal with the, you know, with the pandemic. Um, and this is the sad thing about, you know, these areas where they are big, big problems um, that we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg and it's going to be a few years before we're really in the thick of it, uh, but it needs action now. Um, and it's a bit like climate change where uh, we might end up acting too late. Um, and that's a real worry. Here's a good question from Heather. What do you think of probiotics at the chemist shop? people try to sell us when we get our antibiotic prescriptions filled. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> it's so, oh, it's one of these really tricky things that actually um, there are, so there's some really, really good evidence um, for use of probiotics in some conditions. Like for example, um, there, uh, so babies in India that have diarrhea, if they're given probiotics, you know, it really helps them. So there's some really good cases of where they're really helpful. And then there are others where it's just a little bit of a waste of money and not huge amounts of really good research has been done. And I think it's really telling that um, a few years ago when the EU brought in um, some kind of, they tightened up their rules around how you could advertise things. And so they got all, all the probiotic manufacturers basically had to give more evidence in order to be able to make really strong health claims. 
And the really interesting thing is they still can't make strong health claims. So the evidence just wasn't there, right? So I think if you see something that says supports, supports your immune system, supports whatever, it usually means the evidence isn't really there. And I guess in the case of some things, well, they might not do you any harm. For others, they may do. We just don't know. So, um, yeah, probably just have some live yogurt. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so Faith asks, how do you think we can encourage more openness in science? Seems particularly important considering the global effort needed to fight COVID. Yeah, this is a great question because um, one of the big problems around openness is that it's not incentivized. So actually the whole way that science and academia works is, you know, you get uh, promoted basically if you're really secretive. So uh, what I mean by this is if you're really secretive and you do, you know, you squirrel away your work and then you come up with some amazing discovery that you basically publish in a high impact journal, then that's a really big brownie point for getting promoted. Um, but it's actually, if you think about the way science needs to work and we're seeing this in this pandemic, it is completely contrary to actually having good uh, good impact, good results. And what we really need is much more openness. You know, I'm, what really worries me is how many dead ends people go down and keep going down because nobody reports those results because there's really nowhere people want to see it or, or put it. It's just not a priority. And so I think we need to change the incentives. We need to be able to, um, it needs to be this transparency and openness needs to be something that's actively rewarded. And it kind of isn't because it sort of goes against the, the, um, the kind of structures at the moment. Um, and so for someone like me who has a career and wants to make this change, it's actually a very hard thing to do because I really worry about my students who need those publications and things. And, you know, um, and so we're, the actions I'm making, because I think they're better for science, are probably not good for people and, you know, the people in their careers. And that's a real, that's a real worry. So it's something I really struggle with. Um, but what we're seeing here in this pandemic, you know, we're seeing the use of preprints. Um, we're seeing a much better, I mean, we're seeing the best of science and we're also seeing the worst of science that kind of there, there, there are two sides to this. Um, but I, but I think it's sort of encourage, it's showing people how we have to do things differently. And I really hope if, if uh, you know, we can take that out of this, that we, that we all start doing um, things more openly. But we're going to have to change the incentives if we want it to stick. Now, oh, I've lost your sound. Clearly, Alex was um, interested, but intrigued by the whale conjugating with the giraffe. Um, and Alex has asked, are there limits to which bacteria can conjugate with which bacteria? Or can very, very different bacteria do that? Yes, very different bacteria can do that. Um, I do, this is not something I've studied, uh, so I don't know the limits, but I do understand that they can be very different types of, yeah, very different species. And I suppose another just from an observation, and you've sort of touched on it, but people who, um, and my mother is one such person, who never used to complete her antibiotic, um, you know, course of antibiotics. She was stopped feeling crook, so she'd stop taking, they'd go in the, cu in the cupboard for next time she had bronchitis, and she'd pick them up again and might not even com complete them there. So is that, is that obviously contributing, you might think, to antibiotic resistance, people not um, completing their course of antibiotics? Yeah, and then potentially taking it for something else. I mean, who knows whether you're taking it for the right thing and whether those antibiotics are even active anymore or active enough. I mean, this is one of the issues of, you know, taking things and, and then um, not giving the full dose so that the bacteria are not exposed to the right amount of the um, antibiotic. Certainly should never be sharing them, should, should be finishing them. There, there are some... Um, so what's also kind of really interesting in this space is that um, our understanding of what antibiotics are, you know, or how long antibiotics are needed to take for different things is changing. So there are some infections where um, a doctor will say, oh, actually for this one, you know, you can stop taking it once, you know, you've reached this point, um, but then you really need to give what's left over back to the pharmacist, right? And you only ever do that on, um, uh, on a doctor's instructions. Um, for other ones, it would be absolutely catastrophic if you stop taking your drugs too early. One disease like that is tuberculosis, which takes months and months of treatment, uh, and is one of the reasons why we have resistance uh, building up is because people uh, don't want to take these drugs for so long. And it's no wonder because they're horrible drugs. 
Now, just slightly different tangent, you've obviously had a very successful career in science and you're probably currently influencing hopefully lots of young scientists out there to take, uh, to take that career for themselves. Do you think you're, what you know of the, the New Zealand education system, are there things we could be doing better um, to encourage and support uh, women in particular to go into a career in science? Gosh, this is a tricky one. <laughs> I almost feel slightly uncomfortable about being a role model for young women coming into science because sometimes it's not a great place to be. So there's a, there's a lot of work that people like me have to do to try and make our institutions more welcoming and a place where women uh, can thrive and can, and can stay. Um, because what we see is, uh, it's called the leaky pipeline of uh, basically the, the, we have lots and lots of uh, you know, young women coming in um, and then they don't make it to really senior positions. Um, and there are lots of reasons why that happens. Um, so I think that, and lots of that is kind of to do with biases. Um, we see this throughout everything. So uh, it's so interesting that, um, you know, one of the criticisms that I get a lot is that I can't possibly be a serious scientist, partly because I'm a good communicator, but also because I've got pink hair. Like somehow the color of my hair has something to do with my ability to do science. And this is kind of really interesting. And I mean, I never dyed my hair. Um, what well, just never occurred to me that it, it should be a barrier. So it's kind of, um, and it has been a little bit, but one of the reasons I've kept it is precisely to show the people around me that actually, you know, you can be you and be a scientist. And actually, I think that's really crucial that the more of us that are a bit different that are in this environment, the better it is for science. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that people will be encouraged to follow the things that they're passionate about. I mean, I think we're also really seeing uh, in the pandemic, it's not just about science, it's about communication, you know, it's about understanding history, you know, all of us are important and everything we do is important. And I think that, you know, we all interact in really different ways. I mean, one of the things, um, so while I'm really, uh, you know, I'm proud of our antibiotic discovery work, I mean, we haven't made anything yet, um, I would hope that we might be part of something that, you know, would end up with a potential drug, chances are probably fairly slim, to be honest. Um, but I had always hoped that that would be where I would have an impact. And it's been so fascinating through COVID-19 to realize that actually the place where I've really made an impact has been collaborating with a cartoonist called Toby Morris to make graphics about the pandemic that people understand why they're being asked to act the way they're, they're asked to act. And so it has been that communication, the ability to work across disciplines. You know, for me, it wasn't another discipline of science. It was another, you know, it was to be able to um, communicate with an artist and cartoonist. And so I think we should be, you know, everybody should be following the thing that they're passionate about and realizing that we all work together. We should be working together in different ways to tackle all of the problems that we have. They're not just science problems, they're society problems and they take all of us. And I think that's something that COVID has shown us, that people, I think, because there's been such wonderful explanations from yourself and others and epidemiologists, that people have probably actually tuned into and got a deeper understanding of COVID than perhaps they have in other health crises that, that we've faced. Although mm -hmm. some of the global leaders, you might think, could have tuned in a bit more closely and uh, made some of their decisions a bit more evidence-based. <laughs> now, Anonymous has got another great question. Who would win in a fight, a virus or a bacterial infection? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, well, it kind of depended on who was actually fighting. So, I mean, the amazing thing, of course, about viruses is they, they are specific viruses that infect bacteria. So in that case, they would win, <laughs> right? Um, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, what we're seeing now is, you know, a viral pandemic. Um, so we're seeing how important viruses are um, and just how they can upend everything, you know, <laughs> everything we know. Um, but bacteria are important too. <laughs> uh, and so um, that, that's a hard question. <laughs> I'm going to say they're all important on slightly different timescales. Um, but if it was a bacteriophage, which is a virus that can infect bacteria, then they would definitely win. <laughs> Great answer. Um, now, a question, probably thinking of Ashley, but if you were Director General of Health, how would you prioritise this research? <gasps> I tell you one of the things that I have learnt 
through this pandemic is I'm really glad I'm not the one who has to make those hard decisions. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing both with government and with the Ministry of Health that they are having to juggle a lot of different things and a lot of different cons considerations. And so while we can say from the science perspective or from the infectious diseases perspective, this is what is important, we aren't the only voice at the table, right? I mean, there are other things that need to be considered. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there, we have so many problems. <laughs> and I think this is one of the things, again, about, it's not just about our health, it's about everything. And I think what we're seeing here and in other countries, actually, so one of the things the virus has really shone a really big spotlight on, and it's not something we didn't know already, was that, you know, where inequalities are, um, there's also that that's kind of, you know, we're seeing terrible outcomes of the virus, you know, in communities that, um, you know, are, are, um, uh, have bad health care and all sorts of things. And so actually, it's not just about prioritizing research. It's about really rethinking also, how do we, um, how do we close the gap between incomes? How do we make sure everybody um, has good opportunities in life and that aren't saddled with all of the, you know, the burdens that come, health burdens and other things that come from um, inequality. So, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, those are the, those, it needs a really big joined up kind of thinking about what kind of society we want, and what do you value? And human health should be absolutely part of that. Um, but the research comes from lots, lots of different places, I think. Great response. <laughs> now, I've got a question here. How much funding do you think it would take to test the entire catalogue of fungi? Oh, gosh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a people thing, actually. So it's about how many people can we get on this project? Uh, and so... Um, yeah, I mean, we currently, so we, we have about, what is it, about $200,000 a year, and that gets us our one chemist and our one a microbiologist, and we can go through, uh, I don't know, a few hundred, <laughs> so <laughs> we need a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> right, people, get sponsoring those fungi and buying those t-shirts. <laughs> now, we're, we're nearly out of time, so I'd really like to Thank you, Susie, for a wonderful presentation and a very engaging discussion. And, you know, Einstein said that failure um, is success and progress. And I think it's really important that, that you've got this motivation to share what doesn't go so well, because, as you say, that often isn't the case. And it would allow other scientists to learn from what you've done and scaffold of that and, and grow knowledge. So thank you very, very much for sharing your time with us. Thank you, everybody who's listened in. Um, and just a reminder that Raising the Bar is a series of, we have six speakers, um, this is our second, so we've got another four to go, so please make sure you go in and uh, log in and look at what other speakers are available and join another talk. Um, thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Good evening, good morning, wherever you may be.